Police want to know, is he the man responsible for the murder of young blonde girls, multiple rapes, and one more attempted murder? He should run all over me. He ran over you twice. Yeah. <laughs> and I really hurt. There was a real palpable feeling of fear amongst women and girls in, in South West London at that time. He specialised in young victims. He was simply killing blonde young women for pleasure. His actions brought one of the world's mightiest news organisations to its knees with the murder. Levi Belfield has issues. His father dies when he's a child. Levi grows very close to his mother. His mother is a very important, this matriarchal figure in his life. Levi is tiny at 16, still shorter than five feet tall. His physique makes him feel unattractive to girls at a West London comprehensive school, and he's profoundly miserable. He didn't want to be small. He wanted it to be... He was the front of the family, I think. Belfield was a woman hater. He was bullied at school um, quite, quite acutely by a number of girls, and he, uh, perhaps that was the, uh, you know, one of the causes of his loathing for women. By his late teens, Levi Belfield decides to change things. And in his later years, he took steroids, and in fact, the first time I ever saw him, his, uh, his arm muscles, his leg muscles were absolutely huge, and his neck was, was, was bulked up beyond all belief. He wanted to be the man, but he didn't want to be the little boy anymore. Some find his new look attractive. Belfield was to marry four times, have 11 children. One woman in his life was to experience both profound menace and how much fun he could be. He was the life and soul of the parties. He was the top dog. He was the one that everyone wanted to be with, everyone wanted to be seen around. He was like the, the don of like, the area. Pete Rodriguez was to become a pivotal figure in Belfield's life as a friend and a colleague. Oh, I haven't got no brothers or sisters or anything like that. Uh, maybe it's, it's unconsciously knowing I've got a bigger sort of brother, in a sense, looking out for you, you know, because that's the impression he give you, he'll be looking out for you. But Rodriguez would soon carry the scars, emotionally and physically, of having Levi Belfield as an older brother figure. There are deeply unsettling sides to Levi, which occasionally appear. After a couple of drinks, he'll get aggressive. he start off enjoyable, then he end up being a nightmare. He rather go to try and beat up somebody. Belfield takes that aggression home. His first wife leaves him after one particularly savage beating, and his next partner quickly sees the steroid-induced muscle man's violent side. I bite you, burn you, kick you, punch you. Remember he split the back of my head open once, because he was fixing, doing something to the car, and I didn't answer him quickly enough and he had a tool in his hand and he just turned around and as I walked away, he hit me straight in the back of the head and split all my head open down there. That was one of the times. Particularly unsettling for Joe is her husband's irrational hatred of blonde women. When you find a magazine and all, only the blondes' faces are slashed and, you know, he's got, he goes mad. And when I fronted him about it, I mean, he, I really got a good hide in that day. And he, like, he told me straight, he said, I hate blondes. They're all fucking slags and they should die. And I don't know if it's because his mum's got jet black hair and she is the matriarch of the family and she rules with an iron rod. Or somewhere along the line, a blondes really hurt him or something like that. He just loathed women. And for some reason, he loathed women who are blonde. And on top of that, he seemed to loathe women who were young. Belfield's loathing of young girls doesn't stop him wanting to have sex with them. 
an ambition he can pursue in a job he gets at a nightclub. He became a bouncer, I think, because it was a regular supply of eager, young schoolgirls who would line up outside the clubs he was the bouncer at. And he seemed to take it as a badge of honour that he was targeting girls who were legally beneath the age of consent. Belfield would never stand trial for some of the offences he was alleged to have committed against young girls. He would leave no DNA trace as he forced himself on some of the girls that he comes across. He was someone who kept a mattress in the back of one of his vans whereby he would sometimes ply girls with ketamine, a very powerful tranquilizing drug, or, or, or sometimes cocaine. He would sell them, and it, sometimes in exchange for, for sexual favors, or sometimes, even more menacingly, he would actually abuse them after they were high on drugs. Between 1995 and 2001, a string of complaints are made to police by young girls. But their memories are almost always hazy. Drugs taken unwittingly mean that his victim's evidence is unreliable. Nothing is ever pinned on Belfield. With other even more serious crimes to put before a jury, the sex offences were to remain on the files without further action. I sent a report to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, asking for directions on a series of five uh, drug-induced rapes on teenage girls between the ages of 14 and, and 17. Uh, the evidence wasn't there at that time. In the late 90s, Belfield had begun to apply his intimidating frame to one of his jobs, wheel clamping. He would have no mercy, and no matter who it is, he, his first and only concern is getting the money out of the person. And when he takes on a third job, buying and selling vehicles, he uncovers a car-crushing concern that will become vital to his needs. That was part of his modus operandi, was to, oh, well, we'll have one car one minute, and when we have three cars, or we'll have this car today and that car tomorrow. So if you ever wanted to try and find him, which car were you going to look for? He adds a final chilling element to his methods the nerve to approach any female, young or old, and ask for sex at any time of the night or day. Levi Belfield was a menace to women. As they drove around in a, a, a white van, he would lean out the window, shout, leer at other women. He would um, wolf whistle, and he would be generally quite unpleasant. Belfield rents a flat in the Walton-on-Thames area of southwest London. Soon after, a 13-year-old schoolgirl, Millie Dowler, goes missing. <laughs> she fitted his obsession. Millie Dowler went to school but decided to take the train home. She walked out of the station, turned right north to walk home to her parents' house. A girl she vaguely knew was standing, waiting for a bus to take her home. She stopped and chatted about the usual things that teenagers chat about. Boys, they recently were planning to go to a gig, and they spoke about what they were intending to do at the weekend. At some moment between eight minutes past four and ten minutes past four, on that March afternoon in 2002, she disappeared into thin air. She vanished in the blink of an eye, and just exactly what did happen, what happened to her that, that, that afternoon, was, became a, a great speculation and, and a great deal of fear. The day she went missing, you know, maybe she'd run off or, like everyone else thought, you know, she'd just gone off with friends or something like that, which I think everyone hoped, obviously. Had she run off? Was she with friends? Or had Levi Belfield's obsession claimed its first victim? If they rejected his advances, he would exact a very extreme form of revenge, this hammer attack. Police are searching for Millie Dowler. By 1997, Levi Belfield's second wife, Joe Collings, had taken enough of his beatings. She had left him. He soon moves on to wife number three, Emma Mills. On returning home from work on March 22, 2002, the day after Millie had gone missing, she sees Belfield doing something he'd never done before, changing the bed. All the bedclothes have been removed. 
the sheets, the duvet cover, everything. And she says to Levi, what, what's going on here? He said, oh, well, the dog had an accident on the bed. Which she thought was rather strange because the dog was extremely well house trained. But what he was really doing was he was disposing of the mattress that was at the property. Six months after she went missing, late in 2002, the body of Millie Dowler is found 30 miles from the train station where she was last seen. She'd been dumped in woods. Police don't suspect Belfield. The difficulty the police have, or had, was that Millie Dowler, there was absolutely no forensic evidence whatever. There, were no, there was no soft tissue remaining on her body. It was simply bones. Um, no one had seen anything. Not a single witness had seen her go. Belfield was very forensically aware. He knew that if he turned off his mobile phone, they couldn't trace him using triangulation of his mobile phone signal. His phone was off that day for nine and a half hours. You shouldn't underestimate his cunning. He, was, he wasn't educated, but he was very intelligent uh, uh, and, and was cunning enough to think very quickly how to extricate himself from difficulties that he had. That cunning meant that rather than drive a car on the day Millie disappeared registered to his own name, Belfield borrows a friend's. It was a day, Wu. He told me that he lent it to one of his cousins, and I said, well, you better get it back, because I'm fed up with her having my car. And then that night, he came home and told me it had been stolen. Well, we all know now it wasn't, was it? Because he'd been in the buying and selling car business, was also into the scrapping car business. And so he would have been perfectly within his capacity to um, have the car crushed, literally dismantled into tiny parts without a moment's hesitation. Months later, when poring over street footage, they see the Red Day Wu cruising the area, but they make no connection to Belfield. His name didn't quite come up. Police also didn't know just how well Belfield knew the area where Millie's body had been found. His horse event jumping second wife did. Where Millie's body was found from the horse show was literally walking distance. And when I used to go there and jump, he used to disappear off through the woods and 